Welcome back, horror fans, cinephiles, and Jallo enthusiasts. This is Tanner Leeser, your host for all things Jallo, here on The King in Jallo. Our next stop on our journey through Jallo cinema is the third Jallo film from Umberto Lenzi, A Quiet Place to Kill, released in 1970. This video is an edited down version. Herein, you will find the overview portion of the full length video. Coming next week will be the complete deep dive with the review and Jally Tally. This video may be watched without any spoilers. Here is A Quiet Place to Kill Overview. A Quiet Place to Kill, sometimes called Paranoia, is an Italian, French, and Spanish co-production. The film is directed by Umberto Lenzi, written by Marcello Coscia, Rafael Romero Marchand, Bruno Di Geronimo, and Marie-Claire Soleville. And the music is by Gregario Garcia Segura. The players involved are Carol Baker as Helen, Jean Sorel as Maurice Sauvage, Anna Proclemer as Constance Sauvage, Marina Kofa as Susan Sauvage, Alberto Dalbas as Dr. Harry Webb, and Louis Davila as Albert Duchamp, or Jaime Duchamp in our English version. The plot follows Helen, a down-on-her-luck race car driver, who after suffering an accident, is offered by her ex-husband, Maurice, to stay at his villa and recuperate. Helen has her suspicions of Maurice, assuming he wants to reconcile, but she takes the offer. Upon arrival, she discovers that Maurice has remarried and his new wife, Constance, is the one who actually invited Helen to stay. The two form a close bond, allowing Constance to confide to Helen that she hates Maurice, and she wants for the two of them to get rid of him together. The plot very much thickens as the plan is put into action. Round three of Umberto Lenzi and Carol Baker. For some viewers though, the duo and their intrigue might be wearing thin. This plot is another one which borrows a bit from Le Diabolique, but doesn't have the distinction of having Ernesto Gastaldi as its screenwriter, and quite honestly, Lenzi ought to move on from this type of plot entirely. To the film's credit, there is a very effective twist in the plot, which I suspect most people don't see coming. The film does unfortunately pile on a few too many absurd, contrived, and incongruous plot threads and attempts to weave them into something. For example, Helen in her past was a very pampered housewife without much skills to earn a living on her own, but after separating from her abusive husband, she is forced into working in order to keep a roof above her head. What does she do? race car driving. There is no setup for this, which there could have been, but the more logical solution would be to just have given her a different, more believable job to begin with. It just comes off as the filmmakers thinking that race car driving would be a very neat thing to film and to put on screen, which I guess they're vaguely correct about. The film also unfortunately works over time to make its main characters as thoroughly unlikable as possible. This trope is typically done better in Bava's Jolly. You know, where people are getting knocked off readily like it's a slasher, but here we are forced to sit and simmer with these personalities. The viewing experience makes for an environment where we are less concerned about what happens to our protagonists in the long run. Being the third Jallo in a row, the formula for Lenzi is beginning to show signs of fatigue and possibly apathy from himself. To his credit, his next Jallo with Baker, Knife of Ice, 1972, will at least take a risk and do something completely different. A Quiet Place to Kill does, however, come off as a repeat of its predecessor films. I'll mention that I recall enjoying this film more than So Sweet, So Perverse, 1969, and Knife of Ice. And though I may like this more than Orgasmo 1968, I can admit that it is not quite on the same level as that movie. The cast earns their paychecks, not for breaking new ground or going against the mold, but for bringing life to one-dimensional cutouts of characters, which is very difficult to do if you're not in a campy genre flick. John Sorrell returns to embody a playboy role he's already done numerous times. He could be sleepwalking and nobody would complain. Carol Baker forces us to suspend our disbelief as we watch her early on engage in circuit racing, which thankfully we don't have to do for long, but as the film revs up its main plot, Baker is placed into a very typical role where she becomes a pawn in the plot, and by this point I think we are mostly all fed up with this arrangement. 
Marina Kolfa plays Maurice's stepdaughter in the later part of the film, and she breathes the most fresh air into the film, both in performance and in character. Marina was born in 1951. She only was in the film industry for a short while before hanging up her coat and walking away. After this, she would appear in The Last Rebel, 1971, remembered as one of the failed attempts of Joe Namath, an ex-football player, to break out as a movie star. A Quiet Place to Kill would remain as the biggest and most popular role for Kalfa, who would later pass away at the age of 59 in 2011. For Lindsay, perhaps this film had taught him that he would have to adapt his approach to the genre if he was to continue making Jallo films. He would make several more, including An Ideal Place to Kill, aka Oasis of Fear, 1971, the aforementioned Knife of Ice, 1972, Seven Bloodstained Orchids, 1972, Spasmo, 1974, and Eyeball, 1975. But Lindsay's Jello films seemed to have peaked in the late 60s when he was one of the trendsetters, and into the 70s, his name would begin to carry more weight and appeal within the poliziateschi genre of Italian cinema, thanks to films such as Almost Human, 1974, and Violent Naples, 1976. But I digress. Thank you for watching this overview only video. Don't miss the full overview, review, and jally tally for A Quiet Place to Kill next week. As of right now, you can find the movie streaming on Amazon Prime, Shudder, and Plex. Comment your predictions for the AZ score for the movie and its final jally tally score, and then come back next week and see how close you were. Don't forget to like this video and join me next week to see the rest of this review. You were very kind to have bought me the dresses. They fit perfectly. Maurice remembered your measurements. Oh? How could I forget such perfection? Typical European male. Selfish, amoral, and corrupt. Puritans are the best in bed.